Welcome to the tutorial session. We have already completed three lectures that talks about the fundamentals of computer architecture as well as the basic principles of instruction pipeline. Today's session is planned such that you will be familiar with certain numerical problems on the topics that is already covered in lecture 1, 2 and 3. I will be solving these uh, numerical problems so that you will get a better idea of uh, how to understand the topic in depth. We will be covering topics related to performance of uh, processor design including Amdahl's law and then some fundamental concepts in instruction pipeline and uh, certain aspects related to the hazards and about multi-cycle floating point pipeline operations. So, we will be having such kind of similar tutorial exercises every week. This will help you in deeper understanding the topic. So, I request you to go through the sample questions that has been already posted in the forum and get familiarized with those questions. The assignments that are floated every week will be somewhat in sync with the kind of questions that we solve in tutorial exercises. So, let us move to the first question. Consider a code fragment A equal to D star B plus C minus E, where A, B, C, D and E are memory locations. So, we have to execute this code on a processor called Titan. Now, we have to write down the sequence of instructions, the instruction sequence that is generated for this code fragment. If Titan is going to be a stack machine or it is going to be an accumulator machine and the third one if it is a load and a store machine. So, this is the code that is given A assigned equal to D star B plus C. So, if this is going to be the code, how a stack machine is going to operate on it? We know that in the case of a stack machine, we have a stack that is from memory. You have to push the operands into the stack and whenever we wanted to perform an operation, the operation will be carried out on the top of the stack and the very next element after the top of the stack. So, when you look at this particular example, we know that A equal to D star B plus C, since the bracket is given, B star C is to be done first. And we know that we cannot directly perform any add or subtract operation. Any operation that is done on a stack machine, the operands are implied, they are on the stack. The two top elements on the stack will be the operands. So, the B plus C is the first operation to be done. So, before doing this plus operation, we wanted to make sure that both B and C are there in the stack. So, the first operation that we will do is we have to push the value of D, then we have to push the value for B. So, now if you look at the stack, the stack may contain D, then followed by the stack may has B in it, and then we are going to push the third operand C. So, now your top of the stack is C and top minus 1 is B. Now, we have the sufficient operands to perform the operation. So, we can perform the operation. The operation is plus. So, we are going to perform an add operation. Once add is done, then what happens is you are going to push out these two elements and we are going to perform B plus C and the sum of B plus C is going to be added into the stack. So, B plus E, once you perform A, that B and C adding operation, the adding operation, then B plus C gets stored into the stack. So, the top of the stack is now B plus C. Now, we know that as per the sequence that is given, we have to perform D star the sum of that. So, that is the operation to be performed. So, if you wanted to perform that operation, then we have to work on the multiplication aspect. So, next is the product operation that is to be done. So, you, when you perform multiplication, 
these two elements are popped out and the star operation is carried out. So, in this context, let us try to see that d star b plus e that the product is going to be added into this stack. So, we have now the latest value in stack is d star b plus c which is already saved in the stack and there is only one element in the stack. So, we have to understand that when you perform any operation let us say it is an add operation or a multiplication operation that top of the stack is defined as top of the stack operator top of the stack minus 1 that is the operation that is carried out here. So, now we have to push the next element. So, our next operation is going to be push E. So, the result of which this is A E is going to be pushed on to the stack and now we have this is going to pop out that is what we get and we get the product value and then product minus E that is what is we going to do. So, when you perform a subtraction operation E is going to be popped out the product value that is d star b plus e is going to be popped out and then you perform the operation and then we are going to push the result back. So, and then at the end once this is over at the end of this subtraction operation the resultant value is stored into that. Now, our final value should be available inside a. So, the last operation that we need to carry out is pop of a. So, that completes our code generation for the stack machine. Now, we try to understand as given in the question what is going to be for an accumulator machine. Let us try to understand what is an accumulator machine. Accumulator machine means for every operation one of the operand the first operand is going to be the accumulator and the resultant is also going to be accumulator. The second operand can be a memory location. And there are operation called load and store. Load operation means load of x means contents of memory location x is copied to accumulator. Similarly, store of x means contents of accumulator is stored into memory location x. So, in the question we have it has been specified that a, d, b, c and e all are memory location. So, we have to make sure that before performing an operation in we have to load one of the operand into the accumulator. So, the first operation that we will do is load b. So, b is the value that we have. So, now with this means b value is copied to accumulator. So, accumulator now carries the value of b. And now we are going to perform add of c. So, then this means accumulator assigned is equal to whatever be the value of accumulator plus c because it is an add operation. So, already we have value b in the accumulator. So, it is b plus e. So, and the resultant value of b plus e is stored in the accumulator. And now, since this portion is already done, I can perform a multiplication operation with d and that is what is going to happen. So, with this, we are going to have accumulator is equal to accumulator star d. That is going to be the operation in multiplication. So, we get now d star b plus c in the accumulator. And now we are going to subtract e. So, then accumulator is equal to accumulator minus e. So, the resultant value is now in accumulator and towards the end we are going to store the value. So, then that means a is assigned to the value of accumulator. So, in this way first you load the first operand into the accumulator that is what we see with the help of a load b instruction. The content of b is getting loaded to accumulator and when you perform add c whatever is there in accumulator that is added with the contents of memory location c. So, any operation let us say it is add multiplication or subtraction whatever the operand that we have it is a memory operand. So, one of the operand is in accumulator the other one is in memory location and the name of the memory location is specified in the instruction. So, once you perform add and c then you perform the subtraction operation and the final result is going to be stored into a. So, this is how uh, the code that is being generated for the accumulator machine. Now, the third category of instruction type that we have to generate is for load store machine. We have to understand that in the case of a load store machine, arithmetic operations can be performed only between two registers. So, in the case of stack architecture, both the operands are in the stack. In the case of accumulator architecture, 
one of the operand is in accumulator and the other one is in memory. In the case of load store architecture, both the operands, both the source operand should be there in the register and then only you can perform operation. So, no operation is allowed with a memory operand in it. So, let us try to see what happens. In this case, we have to define few registers. So, one of uh, the one that we are going to use is R1, R2, R3 are going to be the kind of the register naming that we use in this example. So, the content of D is loaded to R1, content of B is loaded to R2 and C is loaded to R3. So, now I have these three operand values already available in the registers. Now, the first operation we need to carry out is B plus C. We know that B is available in R2 and C is available in R3. So, an add operation is performed on R2 and R3 and the resultant value is now available in R4. So, this whole value is now available in R4. Now, R4 value should be multiplied with R1 value. We know that R1 is having the value of D. So, multiplication of R1 and R4 and that will give you the complete uh, uh, product of these things in R5. So, now we have this much component available inside R5. Now, we have to load the value of E into one more register. So, load R6 into that is value of E is loaded to R6 and once we have the result, then we have to subtract the value of R5 and R6 and the resultant is stored in R7 and then the last property is store the value of R7 into A. So, when you look at this sequence of instructions, it is easy for us to understand that all the operands has to be loaded into registers. In this case, we are using all new registers in every context for better reuse of registers. If you know that value of a register is no longer required, then I can reuse the register. So, depending on the underlying architecture, let us say it is a stark architecture, the code that the compiler has to generate is different. If it is an accumulator architecture, the code that compiler is generating is different. And for a load store architecture, it is yet another code. So, given the same sequence of instruction, what we have seen, A is equal to D star B plus C, for the same instruction, the kind of code that is generated by the compiler is different because hardware understands different language. So, this is an initial problem. It gives you a deeper understanding about in what way the code that a stack architecture, an accumulator architecture and a load store architecture is working with. Now, I request you to consider the second problem. This is a pipeline associated problem. Time delay of a four segment pipeline in different segments are T1 equal to 35 nanoseconds, T2 is equal to 30 nanoseconds, T3 is equal to 40 nanosecond and the T4 is equal to 45 nanosecond. The interface register delay time is T equal to 5 nanosecond. How long would it take to complete 100 instructions in the pipeline? Assume there is no dependency between the instructions. So, this is a case where we are going to understand about how to design a pipeline. So, to get better clarity, let me try to explain. These are the four segments inside your pipeline and the first one is taking 35 nanosecond, the second one is taking 30 nanosecond, third is taking 40 nanosecond and the last one is taking 45 nanosecond. We have learned in the pipeline that even if different segments in a pipeline is going to take different amount of time, pipeline can advance only together. So, we are going to add the interface registers between them and the interface register is going to consume 5 nanoseconds time. So, the content of this will be returned to the interface register and that is going to be used by the second one and uh, that is the way how the pipeline is going to proceed. But we have to make sure that all the values are taken at the same time. Since the delay associated with each of the segment is varying, we have to find out which is the one that is dominating. So, out of this four segments, this is the segment which is having the largest time unit. So, my pipeline time is going to be governed by 
that it is pipeline cycle time is maximum among all the cases plus the interface time that is 5. So, it is 45 plus 5 that is 50 nanosecond is the timing at which this pipeline is going to operate. So, when we get different time units for different segments, we have to pick that one which is the maximum or which is a dominating one and then add the interface time. So, at every 50 nanoseconds, you are going to read from the interface register, perform the operation in the segment and going to write the result. But you may write the result early because the first unit may write the result in 35 nanosecond where a second will write in 30 nanosecond. Whatever time you are going to write, the next triggering will happen only at 50 because the last unit will be able to complete writing by 45 nanoseconds. So, 50 nanosecond is the time at which we are going to operate the cycle. Now, we will do about how will you take care of the pipeline aspect of 100 instructions, 100 independent instructions by what time these instructions are going to be completed. So, we will try to understand what is the context here. Let us say clock cycle number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 like that it is going. It is a 4 stage pipeline and we know that every clock cycle, one clock cycle is equal to 50 nanosecond that is what we have found out now. The first instruction because it is a 4 segment pipeline, first instruction get complete at the fourth clock cycle. So, it goes through the 4 stages and it gets complete in the fourth clock cycle. The second instruction since it is pipeline, it is going to start at the second clock cycle, it get over at the fifth clock cycle. The third instruction is going to start at the third clock cycle and it gets over at the sixth clock cycle. This is going to be the sequence in which the instructions are going to progress. So, if you try to generalize this, we have 100 instructions. The first instruction is getting over at the fourth clock cycle and thereafter every one clock cycle one more instruction is getting over. So, we have another 99 instructions more. Out of the 100 instruction, first instruction is getting over at the fourth clock cycle because it is a 4 segment pipeline and thereafter for every clock cycle one more instruction is getting over. So, 100 instructions get over in 103 clock cycles and we know that one clock cycle is going to be 50 nanosecond then 103 instructions will get over at 5150 nanoseconds. So, it will take 5150 nanoseconds to complete this operation. So, that is the way how we are going to deal with pipelines of varying time segments. Now, this is a case of a typical true or false question. Which of the following statements is or are true? There are four examples given. So, only if you clearly understand the pipeline concept, you may be able to tell this. Let us try to understand each one of them. Which of the following statements are true? There are four statements given. The first one is raw hazard, raw data hazard could be reduced by operant forwarding. That is the first statement that we have. So, if you look at that, this is the concept of operant forwarding. Whenever we have a data hazard, let us say in this case, we are going to write the result into R1. So, R2 and R3 contents are going to be added into and stored in R1. And that value of R1 is needed in the subtraction instruction and the add instruction. So, operant forwarding is something where whenever the result is ready, the content of R2 plus R3 is ready here, that is forwarded into ALU such that the subtraction instruction can progress. So, in this way, whenever we do operand forwarding, the stalls are eliminated. So, what we see there is a raw data hazard could be reduced by operand forwarding. So, that is a true statement. A normal in order 5 stage MIPS pipeline can achieve an IPC larger than 1. So, what do you, we have to understand what do you mean by normal in order 5 stage pipeline and what is the meaning of IPC. So, if you look at an 
in order pipeline it's a five stage in order pipeline so each instruction will go through five different stages if id ex mem and write back since it is an in order pipeline the second instruction will start only after the first instruction is fetched issued so the sequence is never violated now how many instructions are getting complete we can see that in the fifth clock cycle one instruction is getting over in six one is instruction is getting over in seven one instruction is getting over so in every cycle one instruction is getting over leading to a cpi value of 1 if there are hazards then cpi cycles per instruction will be slightly larger than 1 so ipc is the value which is the reciprocal of cpi instructions per cycle so number of instructions completed per cycle is equal to 1 in the case of a normal in order ideal pipeline so the statement is mentioning that a normal in order five stage mips pipeline can achieve an ipc larger than 1 instruction per cycle larger than 1 can we complete more than one instructions per clock cycle that is not possible in the case of an in order five stage pipeline such cases are possible only if it is an out of order superscalar pipeline so the second statement is false now we look at the third statement for a mips instruction store r2 16 of r3 some contents stored in its id ex pipeline register will bypass the ex unit directly to the ex mem pipeline register to understand that let us revisit the pipeline diagram we have a store instruction r2 16 of r3 let us try to understand what happens in each of the pipeline stages in the execution of this instruction so in the instruction fetch stage this entire instruction the binary value of the entire instruction is loaded into the ifid register now any reading from the register has to be performed in the register fetch state that is the second stage so in this case we have two registers r2 and r3 the meaning of the instruction is the content of register r2 should be written to a memory address that is pointed by 16 of r3 so content of r2 is read similarly in order to compute address content of r3 also has to be read so values of r2 and r3 are now in the id register and this value 16 will also be there the 16 will come through this so 16 won't go through the register file this is the path by which 16 is going to travel now r2 value is not needed in the alu stage that is needed in order to write into the memory so r2 value is directly going to come into the stage whatever is the value of r3 it's added with 16 so r3 plus 16 is carried out here whereas r2 is going to bypass the alu so in the case of a store instruction the value to be stored is going to bypass the alu that will reach the idex register so some contents of the idex register is going to bypass the alu into the ex mem register now if you look at will bypass the ex unit directly to the ex mem so from the id ex pipeline register the value of r2 is going to bypass the ex unit the, content, the value of r2 will not go to the ex unit that is what we are going to see so this is true now let us try to understand what is the fourth instruction a normal five stage in order risk pipeline without operand forwarding can have row and war hazards so what you see here is we have a there is no operand forwarding here so can we have row hazards if you look at this case row hazard means you are going to write the value into r1 and that value one is going to be read so writing into r1 happens here and we need the value of r1 at these stages so you have to forward this value so you are going to have a hazard here in the case of row because we are not using operand forwarding whereas on the right side we see it's a war hazard you are going to read a value from r3 and the second instruction is going to write a value into the r3 
So, when we work on war hazards, these are typical cases of war hazards right after read, you are going to read from R3 that happens here in the second clock cycle and you are going to write the value into R3 and that happens here. So, in the normal 5 stage in order pipeline, reading from R3 for the first add instruction happens in clock cycle number 2 and writing into R3 by the subtraction instruction happen in clock cycle number 6. So, it is not going to have any kind of violation. So, this will not create any issue as of now. Now, try to understand what happens in the case of R4. So, R4 you are going to write the value, you are going to read the value of R4 here and we are going to write into R4 by the AND instruction. So, that is the place where you are going to R. So, wow hazards are not there, there is no wow hazards, but there can be row hazards. So, a normal 5 stage in order risk pipeline without operand power fading can have row and war hazards, this statement is false. You can have row hazards, but you will never have war hazards. So, altogether if you look at statement number 4, that is wrong. So, what is correct is question number 1 and 3 option. These are the two options that are correct in this scenario. So, the correct answer is 1 and 3 that is already mentioned. So, only if you have a deeper understanding about the various operations that is happening inside an instruction pipeline, then only you will be able to solve this. Now, we have one more true or false case, which of the following statements are false? For a MIPS multi-cycle floating point pipeline, the initiation interval of floating point multiplication is larger than floating point addition. So, how will you tackle this statement? There is a floating point multiplication, which we have seen that it has 7 pipeline stages, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5 like that. This is the floating point pipeline M1 to M7 and floating point adding as A1, A2, A3, A4. The initiation interval of floating point multiplication is it larger than floating point addition. For that we have to understand what do you mean by the term initiation interval. Initiation interval means what should be the minimum gap between two operations that is going to use the same functional unit. Let us say I am giving an operation in floating point multiplication at clock cycle 100. In clock cycle 100, a pair of floating point numbers are multiplied, we are going to start multiplication. Initiation one interval of floating point multiply is given as 1, the meaning is at 101, another new pair of numbers can be added into the unit. At 102, another new pair of numbers can be given in the multiplier unit. Since the multiplication unit is pipelined, as long as there is no data dependency between the numbers that are going to be multiplied and the numbers that are there already in the multiplication unit, that means any new pair of numbers can be given to the multiplier unit in adjacent clock cycles. That is what the initiation interval of 1. Whereas, if you look at the division unit, you have an initiation interval of 25. That means, you can give the next number to be divided only after the 25th clock cycle. Similarly, when you look at adding also, since adding unit is also pipeline, that every cycle, new pair of numbers, new pair of floating point numbers can be given in the floating point adder. So, initiation interval of floating point add also is 1 and the floating point multiplication is also 1. So, the statement for a MIPS multi-cycle floating point pipeline, initiation interval of floating point mul is larger than that of floating point add is wrong because both has initiation interval of 1. So, statement number 1 is false. Look at statement number 2. Wow hazard cannot happen in MIPS multi-cycle floating point pipeline. What do you mean by wow hazard? Right after right hazard. If the second instruction is going to write on a value where the first instruction is also going to write. So, consider the case that let us say you are going to write on a number, add is going to write, let us say add is going to write on the register F2 
and multiplication is also going to write on a register F2. Add is issued after the multiplication, add comes after multiplication because of long multiplication stage, multiplication get over only here whereas adding gets only will be done before that. So, we are able to complete the adding operation before the multiplication operation is over that is exactly wow hazard. When you have an instruction j and instruction i, let us say instruction i is going to write into a register r, instruction j is also going to write into a register r. If j happens after i, then if j writes before i is going to write into r, that is called wow hazard. So, in a multi cycle floating point operation, wow hazard cannot happen, that is false. because wow hazards will surely happen. Now, the third statement in a MIPS multi cycle floating point pipeline that supports operand forwarding, there will be 7 stalls between a pair of adjacent multiplication instruction that has a raw dependency between them. So, this is the floating point pipeline. Now, we are going to talk about a case where two adjacent adding operation, let us say we are going to add two floating point numbers f1, f2 and f3 are going to be added. So, the result is going to be obtained in f1. Similarly, there is one more add where there is a raw dependency that means f1 is one of the operand and uh, let us say this is f6. So, if you try to correct the value of f1 with a for easy grasping. So, the first instruction is going to write into f1, second instruction is going to read from f1. Now, if you look at in a MIPS multi cycle floating point pipeline that supports operand forwarding, there will be 7 stalls between a pair of adjacent multiplication instruction that has a raw dependency between them. So, let me correct rather than this adding operation, they are basically multiplication operation, floating point multiplication operation. So, f mul is the operation. So, two multiplication between them there is a dependency, there is a raw dependency, read after write dependency. So, only if the first one produces the result, when will I get produce the result? F1 will be written only at this point. Now, the value of that is to be used by the second instruction. Now, if you try to revisit the instructions, we are going to see what happens here. Let us take the first clock cycle, this is clock cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and you are in the instruction fetch state that is IF, ID, then it is M1, M2, M3, M4, M6, M7, then this is going to be your normal mem stage and this is the write back. So, this is your first instruction, the second instruction is dependent on the first one. So, when you go to the second instruction, we know that the second instruction since it is dependent on the first one, this is the second instruction I of I D. Now, I cannot start the multiplication because the multiplication can be started only after getting the result and the result is obtained only at this point. So, M1 can start only here even if operand forwarding is there. So, this is the point of M1, M2. So, how many stalls I have to put? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, I am going to introduce only 6 stalls in this case. So, even if I have a dependency between them, IF and ID lines will be completed like in the previous case. So, this is what we have seen. IF and ID is going to be completed. Since I cannot start multiplication because this second line, this is line number 1 and line number 2, line number 2 has a dependency with the result that is produced by line number 1. So, the result is obtained only at the end of the ninth clock cycle, it is 7th stage of floating point multiplication operation. So, I can get the data only at this point, only at the clock cycle 10 I can start my M1. So, till then I have to include stall. So, stall is there at clock cycle 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. So, only there are 6 stalls that are going to happen. 
So, in the statement it is mentioned that there should be 7 stalls between them that is wrong. So, the third statement is also wrong. Now, we go to the fourth statement if a 32 bit value which is represented in hexadecimal 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is stored in memory byte addresses. So, these are the byte addresses in which we are going to store this value. So, each of this memory location 2000, 2001, 2002 and 2003 can store 1 byte of information. So, totally I have 4 bytes of information where uh, 2 of this hexadecimal number will represent a byte. So, 4 byte value is going to be stored in 4 adjacent memory locations in a big NDN format. Then location 2001 holds the value 56. Let us see whether it is true or false. We will try to illustrate the concept of big NDN and little NDN. So, in little NDN format, let us say this is the number what you are going to store from a register. So, these are the 4 bytes. The least significant byte is going to be stored in the memory address A. Then the most significant byte address will be stored in A plus 3. So, the least significant byte is stored in the lower address, most significant byte is stored in the higher address. When you come to big NDN format, the most significant byte is stored in the lower address. So, in this case of an example, we have memory location 2000, 2001, 2002 and 2003. These are the four memory locations that we have mentioned and we have the value that is uh, represented by 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That is the number what we are going to operate. So, it is 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, it is in which format? What we are trying to understand it is in big NDN format. So, in big NDN format, the most significant byte is going to be stored at the lower address A. So, in this case 1, 2 gets stored here, 3, 4 gets stored here, 5, 6 will be storing it here and 7, 8 is stored here. Now, the question is asking whether location 2001 holds 56. So, 2001 is holding 34. So, the statement 2001 holding 0x56 is false. So, the last statement is also false. So, the question was which of the following statement is false? All the four statements 1, 2, 3 and 4 are false. So, that completes our problem number 4. Now, we are moving into the fifth problem. This problem has two subdivisions. A new floating point unit speeds up floating point operations by two times. In an application, one fifth of the instructions are floating point operation. What is the overall speed up? So, we have to understand that your floating point unit is going to improve your performance by two times. So, every floating point operation gets a speeding of 2 factor 2 and there are one fifth of the instructions that are floating point that means 0 0.2 percent or 0 0.2 is the fraction of the instructions that are to be used by the floating point unit. What is the overall speed up? This is governed by Amdahl's law which tells that the speed up is defined as 1 by 1 minus alpha plus alpha by n where alpha is the fraction enhanced and n is the speed up of enhancement for that fraction. Let us try to define the number. So, here n is equal to 2. Value of alpha is the percentage fraction that gets improvement. So, only floating point instructions are getting the benefit. So, 0 0.2 is the fraction. So, once we substitute it 1 by 1 minus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.2 divided by 2. So, when we solve this, we are going to get the answer as 1.11. So, when you use a floating point 
unit that is going to improve the performance by two times for floating point instructions. Let us say the floating point instruction is only 1 by fifth of the total instruction, then what is the overall speed up? The overall speed up is 1.11 times. Now, the question has a second component. So, we will try to revisit the second component. What are we going to get from this? So, the second component is an extension to the first problem. So, whatever applicable on the first problem that should be considered in the second problem also. Assume that the speeding up of floating point unit mentioned above slowed down data cache access resulting in 1.5 times the slowdown. So, your data cache is going to be slowed down by 1.5 times. Assume the load instructions constitute 15 percent and store instructions constitute 9 percent of the total instruction. So, when you go to data cache, whenever there is a load instruction, whenever there is a store instruction, we are going to go to data cache. So, 25 percent are data cache instructions. These 25 percent instructions are getting slowed down by 1.5 times. So, what is the overall speed up that we are going to get? So, we know that we have to slightly rephrase because there are two factors that is coming. One is for floating point operations and one is for data cache instructions. So, floating point operations are 1 by fifth and data cache instructions are 25 percent. And if you look at the value of n1, you get a speed up of 2 and n2 it is 1 by 1.5 because it is getting slowed down by 1.5 times. So, in the previous example we have seen that floating point instructions are speeded up by 2 whereas, data cache access is slowed down by 1.5, slowed down by 1.5 times means it getting a speed up of 1 by 1.5, speeding up and slow down are just reciprocal to each other. So, the speed up that you are going to get is 0 0.66. Now, because we have two elements that is coming 1 by 1 minus alpha 1 plus alpha 2, these are the percentage fraction of instructions that are impacted and alpha 1 time that is the percentage improvement is n 1 and alpha 2 times the percentage improvement is n 2. So, if you substitute the value 1 by 1 minus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.25 alpha 1 value is 0 0.2 divided by 2 plus 0 0.25 divided by 0 0.66. Once you solve this, we are going to get 1 by 0 0.978 that means the speed up I am going to get is 0.022. So, this is a classical problem where due to a change in one of the unit, you are getting certain instructions getting speeded up. But incorporating that unit has slowed down some other component. So, in this example, the floating point unit that we newly added is improving the performance of floating point instruction by two times, whereas it is making your data cache work a bit slow. So, data cache is going to be slowed down by 1.5 times. So, what is the overall speed up that you get? In that way, if you substitute the values properly in the Amdahl's law, you are going to get the solution. Now, we move into problem number 6. So, in problem number 6, you are given the comparison between a non-pipelined architecture as well as a pipelined architecture. So, given a non-pipelined architecture running at 1 gigahertz that take 5 cycle to finish an instruction, you want to make it pipelined with 5 stages. The increase in hardware forces you to run the machine at 800 megahertz. So, the only stalls are caused by, so you will get a memory stall for what? 30 percent of total instructions are memory and you get 70 cycle stall for 2 percent of total memory instructions. 
Similarly, for branch conditions which are roughly 20 percent of total instructions are branch and out of the branch 20 percent of the branch instruction you incur a two cycle stall. So, what is the speed up that you are going to get? So, we have to understand that in the case of an unpipelined design. So, for unpipelined design of CPI cycles per instruction for unpipelined, so we can put it as UP is equal to 5 because a non pipelined architecture is going to take 5 cycles to finish an instruction. So, it takes 5 clock cycles per instruction. So, CPI of that is 1 and clock cycle time is equal to with 1 gigahertz is going to 1 as 1 nanosecond. Now, when you go to the pipeline architecture, our basic assumption is CPI is going to be 1. So, in the case of a pipeline architecture for every cycle, one more instruction is getting over. In our pipeline, so the CPI of the pipeline architecture is base CPI that means every instruction if there is no dependency or a no stalls between them that is called base CPI called ideal CPI plus stall CPI. You are going to stall for certain instruction. Base CPI is always 1 because every pipeline assumes that the clock cycles per instruction is 1 and now we have stalls here they are memory stalls as well as branch stalls. Now, memory stalls are happening for the memory instructions alone and it is mentioned that you have 30 percent of your total instructions are memory instructions. Out of that, 2 percent of the memory instruction only will result in a stall. So, typically this memory instruction stall happen whenever it is a cache miss. So, 30 percent of the instructions are memory instructions and out of the memory instruction, 2 percent of them will stall for how many cycles? 70 cycles. Now, branch 20 percent of them are branch instruction that is what is being mentioned and out of the branch instructions only 20 percent of them will result in stall and the stall we are going to get is only 2. So, this will sort solve out to 0 0.42 plus 0 0.08 the value is 1.5. So, the CPI under the pipeline version is 1.5. Now, let us try to understand what is the clock cycle time of the pipeline version. It is going to work under 800 megahertz. So, that 800 megahertz corresponds to 1.25 nanosecond. So, we have obtained what is the CPI value in the case of an unpipelined design and what is the CPI value in the case of a pipeline design. Now, while solving this, what is the speed up, the overall speed up we are going to get. So, speed up can be defined as CPI of the unpipelined into clock cycle time of unpipelined divided by CPI of the pipeline processor into clock cycle time of the pipeline. So, in the clock cycle time of the pipeline is going to be larger because for implementing a pipeline, you have to add the interface registers. So, the CPI of unpipelined is equal to 5 and clock cycle time is 1 nanosecond divided by CPI of the pipeline is 1.5 into clock cycle time is 1.2 nanosecond and you are able to get 5 divided by 1.875. So, the overall speed up is 2.66 times. 
So, when you make this 5 stage pipeline which takes 5 clock cycle to complete an instruction which is operating at 1 gigahertz, when you make it to pipeline to version, it is going to improve your performance by 2.66 times including the overhead for the pipeline. So, in this way we are trying to understand what happens in a pipeline, what is impact of stalls. So, and that completes today's the tutorial lecture. So, I hope uh, this session was useful for you to understand and grasp about the subject. So, I request uh, you to go through similar problems that is there at the end of uh, the textbook, the prescribed reference textbook. We will have more such tutorials which will give you more grasp in solving the questions. Thank you.